this week's crypto recap. Everything you need to know about the upcoming Bitcoin halving and why is Uniswap suddenly in the crosshairs of one of the most powerful regulators in the US. It was a big week in crypto. Looking forward to breaking it down, Nick. Yeah, massive week. And this is probably the news we all saw coming in a way, Uniswap in the crosshairs. So really talk about why it matters and why you should be paying attention. 100%. So all in under 30 minutes, we'll get through everything you need to know about all that's happening in the crypto market, starting with a quick market update as always. And yeah, looking back the past seven days or so is one of the most volatile times in the crypto market that I can remember since, you know, around the FTX collapse, just in terms of how volatile the price action was. Um, obviously, you know, that was extremely, you know, significantly affected the price action over the weekend by uh, Iran's attack you know, against Israel. And then we saw commentary from the US and whatnot resulting in you know massive spikes of Bitcoin's price and Ethereum's price um, resulting from that. And I guess what you typically see in crypto as well, when you see spikes or big crashes, you tend to see them extend even further because then you have you know, liquidations. So all derivatives traders you know, having to close their positions. So we saw hundreds of millions worth of liquidations over the weekend, which was... Again, putting it into context, like you very rarely ever see that, uh, just to give you an idea of you know, how volatile the price action was. So really for Bitcoin, we saw it go from high 60,000s in US dollars to as low, yeah, to about 61, 62,000 at the worst of it. And now it's back hovering in, in the middle of the 60s. Uh, and of course, noting there that altcoins really bled more heavily as you would expect, like when, when price is going down quickly. Yeah, yeah they typically you see those, the old coins. So at the top of my head, I think Solana, the seven days is roughly 15% down. ETH is about 8% down and, and BTC, you know, a bit, a bit less than that. So that has resulted in us seeing Bitcoin dominance up at around the highest it's been in three years. So anyone new to crypto, it's just you take the market cap of Bitcoin, you know, and what is the proportion of that compared to the overall combined market cap of all the thousands of cryptocurrencies out there? Uh, Bitcoin is currently, yeah, about 56% dominance, uh, which, yeah, is very significant. And it's something you typically see more so in bear markets uh, where BTC dominance really increases. But now we're actually seeing it continue on into this bull market. So any thoughts on, on all that that we've had in the past few days, Nick? I think just finally we're getting a, another maybe 8% uh, correction for Bitcoin. It's been a, probably a definitive moment of the bull market has been the lack of massive drawdowns in the price of Bitcoin, traditional to you know to other uh, lead-ups to the halving cycle. So I think this is a little indication. But then again, we normally see Bitcoin dominance tend to uh, top out before, I guess, we see this run to the altcoin season. So a lot of people are wondering when altcoin season will come. That typically happens when, when Bitcoin has reached its highest points in multi-years. And then once we see to once we see altcoins start to take a lot of that market share back, that's a strong indication of maybe the euphoria in the market and where we are, in, you know, in this stage of the bull market. Yeah, well said. I suppose in there in those times where people are getting a bit nervous about whether altcoins may or may not return, that's probably exactly the time when you know the altcoin season mm -hmm. is really you know not too far away in the future. So that's the hard bit about being a crypto investor, I suppose, with heavy uncertainty surrounding the outlook for a bunch of cryptocurrencies but we will move on and of course bitcoin still leading the market whatever whatever way it does go and a big reason or a big event happening this week of course is the halving so really we just want to bring us up to speed nick on, on where we're at with the halving and what the implications are yeah so we finally after it feels like it's come around quicker than usual yeah. um, it's absolutely sped through finally the halving which is the four-year cycle where bitcoin's issuance rate uh, halves so at the moment we're um, to mine a Bitcoin block that happens every about 10 minutes, you get rewarded for 6.25 Bitcoins. And this equates to about 900 a day, which is about almost 60 million of daily issuance of Bitcoin. Now, after the halving, so after next week, this is going to be cut into 3.125 or about 450 Bitcoins. And so then we're going to see the amount of daily issuance halve. So instead of that 60 million, we're going to be only getting about 29 to 30 million. This is a huge impact at a time when the ETFs have such strong structural demand mm. towards Bitcoin. Once we're taking now a lot of supply off the market, you know, we're really anticipating this is going to 
have a really profound impact on Bitcoin. So there's a, a lot to watch out here. And I think the what kind of typically happens is we see sort of a market move sideways, maybe even sell off after that, because mm. it gets into the media. A lot of people are talking about Bitcoin, but the real effects don't really happen until about a year to a year and a half after the Bitcoin halving happens. So this is what we've uh, acknowledged in previous cycles. We've only had three of them. So taken with a grain of salt, um, it's not a NASA class that has been around for <laughs> multi-decades now, um, but it is a little bit of a, a metric there, an indicator to note. Um, so these kind of few next months will be really telling to see just how much Bitcoin does sell off or whether the structural demands of the ETF are just going to be so strong mm. that we don't see these 10 to 20% corrections like we saw in previous bull markets. Yeah, well said. There's just 30 million in, in sort of daily issuance. Yeah, if everyone knew it to crypto, it's assumed that the miners will you know, either sell that 30 million straight away, which isn't really normally the case in practice. But at the end of the day, this 30 million that is issued to miners every single day uh, has to has to be sold at some stage to just fund their operations and to take out profits and whatnot. Uh, so that's why that, that halving of 60 million to $30 million per day is so significant. And then as Nick said, the ETF demand, which, you know, the net inflows have been yeah, multiples of of that. I think it's hundred plus million per day, averaging the net inflows that are going to these ETF issuers that have to, um, given the nature of their product, they have to buy the Bitcoin to back the ETF one to one. So that's why this halving, you know, yes, doesn't sound like a lot in terms of BTC, but in terms of dollars, a huge effect. So really excited to see yeah you know, that implication of the halving, and then obviously we've also got you know the emergence of I suppose a new Bitcoin ecosystem or a rejuvenated Bitcoin ecosystem around the time of the halving. Are there any you know, real projects that are coming up for big launches? Yeah, there's uh, in the NFT sort of front and the tokenized Bitcoin front, we have runes that are going to be coming up. Um, it's kind of a new token set, just making it easier to create different tokens inside of Bitcoin. But then we also have a wide range of these so-called layer two projects, uh, which they're not currently... Uh, inheriting any of Bitcoin security. There is a big trade-off and a lot of kind of um, people calling themselves L2s when they're not really. So there's just a matter of all these new projects that will kind of launch at the halving that we're going to see trying to catch that narrative. So I think one's built on Bitcoin. Then we saw even this week, two major, I think, Bitcoin companies launch quite big valuations and new seed rounds. So really excited to see exactly what these happen and in our new newsletter we're going to be keeping members up to date and so be, be on the lookout for that one yeah for sure i think a lot of them using this attention that bitcoin gets to the halving to time the releases and our upgrades to the existing project or to come out of stealth for example and announce their project so bitcoin really obviously going to dominate the discussion i think for the coming weeks at least over to one of the most popular or widely used applications in crypto and one of the most popular or or largest altcoins by market cap, and that's Uniswap. So the ticker there is UNI. The team essentially behind it, for, to really put it you know, simply, is last week big news came out that they um, are likely going to be sued by the SEC, so the Securities Agency in the US. Uh, they received yeah, Uniswap Lab saying that they received a Wells notice which is yeah, really just a heads up more or less from the SEC that if nothing changes, they're probably going to sue them um they may offer some you know agreement or um yeah it, it, some compromise that uniswap labs can agree to but often they're pretty you know stacked against you know uh, something like uniswap labs so we may see the sec yeah, come out come out at some stage soon and and sue uniswap labs this stuff has been happening yeah in the market you know ongoing as long as we've ever been in crypto like there was obviously Kraken, Coinbase, Binance, Bittrex all sued in similar ways last year uh, but this one arguably is is even more important mm. could you maybe just get into it Nick about just why is this SEC versus Uniswap Labs such a significant event? Yeah it's just so big because it's going to be a definitive precedent setting case for DeFi so as Matt talked about we've saw Coinbase in the crosshairs we've seen some other smaller cryptocurrencies get roped in, but this is probably the biggest action against a DeFi 
uh, protocol itself and company behind DeFi. Um, the US have made no uh, mistake or in their wording. They are very clear that they believe that uh, DeFi, crypto, traditional finance, there isn't this ambiguity there to them or the SEC. Mm. And they're pretty clear in saying that if you're not following the current rules, uh, we're going to be coming after you. And that's exactly what's going to be happening with Uniswap. So not only is this precedent setting, but it has kind of knock-on effects throughout the whole industry. Um, whether it's the SEC, whether it's they're going to come out and uh, against the Uni token itself, or whether it's just a protocol, we're going to have some real knock-on effects in terms of you know, what it means to create or use Uniswap. Mm. Because I've noticed in the last few months that the SEC and a lot of jurisdiction in the US, they've come out and really targeted this idea of what is a broker and what is a dealer and kind of rewording to try and rope in DeFi in, into these kind of discussions and labels. So this effectively, I think, is what's going to really matter for the SEC and for the US regulators because they're going to be likely coming out and saying that Uniswap is an exchange in itself and you know they need to register and perhaps even allow their users to do KYC, make sure that they're vetting the protocol properly. And this is a big problem because as we know, it's DeFi and you don't know who's on the other side of the trades and in these liquidity pools. So this is why it's such an important case because um, it begins to question about exactly who's allowed to deposit into liquidity pools. Are US citizens allowed to use Uniswap, the protocol, or is you know, they're going to be any uh, kind of regulations in place to stop that from happening. So just a huge knock on effects and even to the value of uni. Mm. So I know we've talked about in our member reports, they're finally turning on the fee switch. And, you know, is that going to have a huge impact on what the SEC says it's going to be a security or not? Um, if not, if so, then it's going to really um, stake a line in the ground mm. for any other tokens who want to provide value accrual, you know, to to their native tokens. So huge implications and this is finally one i had on my bingo card yeah for my for members if you're listening uh this is what i had on for my what to look forward into 2024 and it was expect a big case against you know uni swap and the biggest you know DeFi platform and we're finally happening and so in my mind it was no big surprise especially when i looked in the you know what real industry experts were saying who have been in industry every day it's just more so uh finally it's happening moment and I know Hayden come out and he said he's more so disappointed and he just wants to fight it. So this is probably the biggest takeaway for me is that Uniswap is best placed yeah. to fight the SEC. Unlike a lot of these smaller exchanges, which basically had to be bled out, these small DeFi platforms, because they couldn't fight the SEC, which is such a big case. So, you know, they have the, the toolkit, they have the industry knowledge, and they have more importantly, the money to fight the SEC in this case. So a lot to look out for. And, no doubt we'll finally get a formal um, accusation and case against them in the coming months. Yeah, that with the Coinbase, just to use an example, in terms of timeline here, of hey, how long does it take from a Wells notice to being sued? If we're just using the Coinbase example, that was roughly four months between when Coinbase came out and said, hey, we received a Wells notice and when the SEC sued Coinbase. Mm -hmm. So look, we could use that as an analogy, but like, Technically, it could be tomorrow. Yeah, and I don't think Uniswap are going to be, you know, shutting down Uniswap anytime soon to try and obey any any um, best practice that the SEC are trying to get them to settle. So we can only expect them to, to fight this head on, and that's what they've said openly that you know they intend to put a stake in the ground and and fight for the entire crypto ecosystem. And the one thing I noted is that uh, there's a lesser known case involved called Mango Markets, which uh, simply some person basically manipulated the protocol to exploit millions and millions of dollars worth of trades on on this DeFi application. There is currently in court because, and most importantly, this is where it ties into Uniswap, is they're saying that you know, any open market manipulation is against the law, no matter if it's DeFi, no matter if it's traditional finance. So they're essentially saying that, hey, you don't get a free pass because you're in crypto and you're creating something on a blockchain. So this is, has wide ramifications, kind of what we're all seeing that they're, they're treating DeFi and cryptocurrency and TradFi one for one and not trying to create these special laws for them. Mm. Yeah, when we talk about also just wrapping it up here from the investment outlook, um, I think the, the, the bull case or best case 
possible for all of these altcoins that you know people speculate will eventually share profits among the token holders um probably that's been the main reason why anyone would invest in any DeFi token uh otherwise also buying it because you want to participate in governance like which there is a case for that for sure um but this is really i think the line in the sand moment and it'll really i guess the outcome of this case will heavily sway whether the dream scenario for altcoin investors particularly DeFi token investors whether the dream scenario comes true where hey are they uniswap they can all agree that this profitable protocol we're going to distribute profits and we're all going to that will drive up the value of the token um or we may get the complete opposite scenario where you know maybe the the court or the judge presiding over sec versus uniswap labs uh decides that hey these are these are pretty tricky instruments and maybe they are more like securities which that's just what why so bad if it's a security so not necessarily that it's bad it's more so i think that, that just the amount of unknowns that then gets created and the amount of administrative and compliance work that would be required i think any discussion about sharing profits with token holders would likely get put back multiple years like five plus years in my opinion um and of course then you've got the actual u.s laws or the congress which actually create the laws which is ultimately the most significant thing you should be watching but that's just to put it in context for any altcoin investors or why did uniswap token crash because of this news i think it's just uncertainty over um yeah the implications of why the uni token has any value but yeah we, of course this is one of the biggest scenarios that will keep happening in the market over the weeks to come so we'll be writing about it for sure for members and covering it on this podcast but bring it back to ethereum and there's talk already their next their next upgrade it feels like yeah they just had one last month but what's this one you got here nick so Pectra is the next major Ethereum upgrade that should be coming our way end of this year, but most likely Q1 next year. There's going to be some code changes, but also a big wallet upgrade that will hopefully abstract a lot of the complexities away, especially for smaller users uh, that you know don't have gas to pay, for example. We're going to finally get them to act a bit more like smart contracts, get a bit more functionality inside the wallets themselves that hopefully should provide a much better user experience. Uh, Also noted there, there's been a lot of discussion, I'm not sure you picked up on this one, Matt, but uh, about issuance of ETH. We're finally maybe going to see ETH issuance change yet again. Uh, Basically, this is just because Ethereum has tipped over 1 million validators in the last couple of weeks. uh, And this growing validators has caused a kind of a small problem, maybe it's a good problem to have, but the concerns about whether you're paying too much for security to secure the Ethereum blockchain. And essentially, as you get more validators, you have to provide them with more token rewards you know, to make their work worthwhile. So there's an idea with the Ethereum Foundation that perhaps we might reduce some of this issuance because we don't really need to be paying for this much security. Uh, at the moment, this is only talks, but potentially we may see this pick up in the next coming months and make its way, who knows, into an Ethereum proposal in the next year or so. Yeah, it'll be something to watch for sure as Ethereum continues its deflationary push lately. I think it's still around 117, 118 million. Um, whether it will trend down to 100 million or so over the years to come will depend a lot on how many people use Ethereum or, or Ether. Or, well, the Ether supply, sorry, may trend down to 100 million. So it's something to watch there. And as I think institutions learn more about these dynamics, I think in particular, uh, ETH's demand will, will really um, will really benefit. Uh, in terms of sort of institutions, we had uh, BlackRock. We talked about their Biddle uh, launch a few weeks ago, and that will be one of the biggest story. I think we both agree it will be one of the biggest you know stories when you look back on this bull market. Um, yeah, for the reasons we discussed in that podcast. But Circle last week implemented smart contract support for for the fund that's you know has the token also called biddle uh so it really just helps uh provide off-ramping for biddle holders allowing them to transfer their shares to circle for the usdc stable coin so already we've actually seen the biddle fund now constitute around 25 percent of all the total value that's um i guess on chain in terms of on-chain treasuries so it's only existed for about a month or so. Um, and we've seen these projects try to tokenize 
U.S. Treasuries, um, which has been ongoing for a number of years now. But already, BlackRock's new fund is yeah is is allocating or is responsible for twenty five percent of that. So yeah, gains and strong adoption already, and I'm sure that will continue in the weeks to come. Maybe moving into altcoin updates now. It's actually been probably one of the the bigger weeks for altcoin updates all yeah. oh, year. I feel like we only say this every year. <laughs> But maybe that's a sign of the crypto market when altcoins are just roaring in terms of announcements. Mm. Uh, but one that will probably have caught your eye is Monad Labs. They're the uh, team building out the Monad blockchain, which was a, the biggest raise of the year, $225 million, uh, And they're a new blockchain. So they're in testing at the moment, but they promise just higher transactions per second, better performance, kind of like a competitor to Solana uh, in creating a foundational blockchain to house significant value and a lot of more, I guess, higher transactional throughput uh, for a lot of these new apps that, you know, just require tons and tons of on-chain activity. So this is probably the biggest raise of the year and one that I'm only seeing ramp up and I'm expecting a mainnet in the coming months. Yeah, for sure. I think Bear Chain was another last week that was a $100 million raise. They're making their own layer one blockchain. So we're getting down to that season now of high, high like financial about fundraising by a lot of projects which is typical in a bull market and you know you'd expect that to continue for throughout this mm-hmm. year one that also you know raised a lot of funding in the past six months was eigen labs they released eigen layer last week so that went live on mainnet sort of in a limited functionality um you know they've got their slashing requirements and rewards that go to these actively validated services they will be coming later in the year and that sort of I guess the big unknown with Eigenlayer, I suppose, is how that natural market will go once once it does go live. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a milestone for the project for sure. And there were six, uh, I suppose, actively validated services or AVSs that also went live, you know, in association with the actual launch of Eigenlayer mainnet. So that's what I've covered for members in the past and we'll be posting about them soon. Uh, as well with what I'm personally going to be doing with my Eigenlayer airdrop and while the Swell token that was also connected to how I used Eigenlayer. So looking forward to that and will be one of the biggest projects of of this bull market. Uh, Solana was back in the news as well. They had, um, well, they had a, they finally sold the FTX estate 1.9 billion worth of Loxol at a discount price of about $64. So this was one of the biggest overhangs for Solana was a lot of fear, a lot of FUD that, hey, there's billions and billions of dollars worth of Sol that is potentially going to be sold and dumped on the market. Uh, what's this going to do to price? It's going to you know, drive it down and a lot of uncertainty. So we finally saw this lock Sol, which couldn't actually be sold, um, you know, was sold at, at quite a notable mm, discount because yeah. at the moment Sol is trading at about $150, got a bit higher probably when the selling occurred. Uh, so it's one of those fears that have kind of been alleviated off the market now, and we probably won't hear too much now of this FTX estate mm-hmm. and fight over the soul. Um, but also in Solana land, there was a lot of trauma with one of its biggest lending protocols, Margin5, uh, with the CEO kind of spectacularly imploded yeah. um, due to a division of, I guess, attitudes of where the project's going. Uh, and that caused about $200 million worth of cryptocurrency that exited margin fi and a lot of solana protocols or a couple kind of use that as a good opportunity to say hey take your soul away from margin fi and give it over here so we saw some uh, drama in solana land yeah it was really strong reaction by well mostly airdrop farmers but it just goes to show how how quickly things could change in crypto where one day your protocol's doing Mm -hmm. pretty well and then you know 24 hours later it's panic stations and trying to repair uh reputation and going damage control and whatnot but yeah, those were main altcoin updates of yeah, a long list. Probably could have gotten it on about yeah. another dozen projects or, or so. But uh, yeah, a lot going on in altcoin land for sure. In terms of looking ahead, yes, we got the, the halving this week. That'll be the big event. Um, but something else to just keep an eye out for is ETFs or spot ETFs going live in other countries. The uh, one that's you know, talk of the town at the moment is Hong Kong, uh, reportedly set to you know, I suppose uh, entities in Hong Kong set to be able to launch their own ETFs or spot ETFs, importantly for Bitcoin as well as Ethereum or Ether. Uh, so we'll see if that, you know, turns out to be true and 
if they do go live any day now, that would be another strong catalyst for, as I said and described earlier, that, that demand coming from the ETF issuers to buy BTC uh, either from miners or from the open market. Um, and then also the case for ETH. Also got Australia coming up with their, um, I guess, deadlines and whatnot for uh, spot ETF for Bitcoin to potentially go live on, on the ASX um, or even the, the other uh, exchange that we do have here as well. It may be going to either one of those. So that's something to note as well. But a lot of other countries you know, onboarding the ETFs, which is great to see. In terms of uh, our underappreciated or overappreciated segment, we'll, we'll wrap things up uh, with this this one. And this week, really wanted to um, something that caught my eye that I don't think a lot of people are, you know, really paying too much attention to. But I've been, you know, digging into the past few weeks has been uh, these new tokens that are coming out and essentially pioneering a new form of distribution. Or, or how do you? Yeah, the big question has always been how do you get your tokens in the hands of people who are actually interested in participating? Not just these airdrop farmers yeah, and yeah. people looking to exploit a lot yeah. of value. <laughs> yeah, that's been a big problem in crypto for many years. Of yeah, as you said, people thousands of people just using a project. Once it launches its token, they sell the token straight away, and they never hear about the project again. Um, so, you know, NFTs were sort of trying to solve this in a, in a way. Um, there's been many attempts, uh, the retroactive sort of funding model as well by Optimism, where they try to do it backwards looking. At, hey, if, you, if you've like been contributing value, we'll reward you sort of in retrospect. This one here that I've been, yeah, covering or looking into personally is like by DGEN, so the token is DGEN. They've got their DGEN chain now, which is live and enjoy. So these are being used, they're tokens that you can earn if you have essentially been tipped. So, you know, you can tip cryptocurrencies. That has been going, that's been going for about a decade. Dogecoin was probably the pioneer of tipping cryptocurrencies and mm-hmm. uh, Bitcoin back in the day. But this is different because it's more like, the 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 supply that hasn't yet been distributed so that that supply is being distributed to people that the token holders decide to tip so warp cast was a great example or farcaster you know if i really like someone's content on farcaster i could um, yeah send them some dgen and tip them but importantly it's not coming from my balance it's coming from yeah the supply that is about to be unlocked by the protocol similarly enjoy on zora uh, Zora, you know, you can create artwork or any type of content or, or media that can be minted and then people can mint them and comment with their enjoy tip allocation, which comes again from the project. So I think this is a big improvement in terms of you ending up with the token being distributed to people who are actually using the project a lot more. Sure, there will be people who farm that and manipulate it. Um, but I think the, the extent or the difficulty with doing so is a lot harder. Um, at least at this stage. So always looking for new ways that tokens can be mm-hmm. distributed to solve the airdrop farming challenge that this industry has. But just want to put that on people's radars. Yeah, and um, for me, I'm just looking squarely on stable coins. I've noticed that they've kind of suddenly tipped up and reaching record highs without anybody really knowing it. So we, we've been seeing some new stable coin launches, but this has really um, taken place because it's about 10% now up until it's new all-time high uh, currently there's about 155 billion 160 billion kind of depends how you define it uh, and importantly it's probably hit an all-time high in the last bull market of about 180 170 billion so we're now really roaring in on this new all-time high and i'm really wondering whether we're going to see that uh, probably by end of the year i'm really anticipating perhaps even in the few months after the halving uh, whether we're going to see a new all-time high and for me this is probably one of the best highest uh, metrics just to keep your eye on because it just tells us the amount of capital that is being uh, put on chain that's staying on chain Mm -hmm. and especially with big institutions like BlackRock now integrating with USDC we're seeing Mm -hmm. just in tremendous demand for on-chain dollars and you know to do a lot of things backed by public blockchains. Yeah we want to watch throughout the year with the institutions really coming on board this time 
Uh, but that does wrap it up for the week. If you are interested in learning or finding out anything more about Collective Shift, the best way to do that is through our newsletter. So weekly updates on the state of the market and other important things delivered to your inbox every Friday. So the place to go to subscribe to that is collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter.